Welcome everybody to the annual Rutgers Distinguished Lecture in Religion. My name is Tao Jiang. I'm the chair of religion department at Rutgers. Today's talk is made possible by the Anna Morgan Fund. Please feel free to post questions in the Q&A area on Zoom webinar and the two moderators will field the questions during the Q&A period. Rutgers Distinguished Lecture in Religion was established several years ago to bring to Rutgers a major scholar of religion each year to share with us their research in this critical area of the humanities. Past speakers include Peter Brown, Princeton, Robert Buswell of UCLA, Ahmed Karamustava of University of Maryland, and Laurie Patton of Middlebury College. We're really delighted to have Robert P. Jones as this year's speaker. Robert P. Jones is the CEO and founder of Public Religion Research Institute and a leading scholar and commentator on religion and politics. He writes a column on politics, culture, and religion for The Atlantic Online. He's frequently featured in major national media such as CNN, MSNBC, NPR, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and others. He holds a PhD in religion from Emory and a Master of Divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's the author of The End of White Christian America, which won the 2019 Grawmeyer Award in Religion. In his newly published book, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, Jones draws on history, public opinion surveys, and personal experience to deliver a provocative examination of the unholy relationship between American Christianity and white supremacy and issues an urgent call for white Christians to reckon with this legacy for the sake of themselves and the nation. Today's talk is based upon this book. Robert and I first met when we were both serving on the program committee of the American Academy of Religion. So we're really grateful that he has accepted our invitation to speak to our community on such an important topic at this particular moment in our history. The moderators today are my two colleagues in the religion department at Rutgers, Dugan McGinley and Haley Sorwitz Israel. Professor McGinley's primary interests includes contemporary Catholicism, gender and sexuality, and the intersection between religion, culture, and society in America. Professor Sorowitz Israel is an expert in religion in the Americas, Caribbean religions, and Sephardic Jewish history. So without further ado, let me give the floor to the speaker and our moderators. Thank you. So thank you, Tao. Um, I'm going to get us started just by offering a question to um, our, to Robert about um, just his book. If you could say a few words, just to kind of set the stage for our conversation about what your overall project is about here, you know, um, whatever you think would get us started nicely in our conversation. Great. Well, thanks so much. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor McKinley and, and Professor Sirwitz Israel for being here today. Um, uh, and uh, also, uh, Tal, it's great to be with you as well. Um, and uh, I'm going to say just a few words that I think, yeah, will set the stage uh, for, the, for the conversation. Um, and, and thank you to the Rutgers Department of Religion um, as well for sponsoring the talk. Um, so, say a little, so the book is White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. Um, and it is a, a blend really of social science and history um, and even memoir. Um, that's something that's a little bit new for me. Um, I mean, most days I, I wear my social scientist hat. Um, uh, but this, this book um, is, is in many ways personal. I'll say a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, but overall, it tells the repressed and hidden story of the centuries-long entanglement of white supremacy and American Christianity and examines how this explains the fault lines we're seeing in this current moment of racial reckoning um, in the country. And I, I do want to just say right, right up top um, that uh, sort, of, sort of my thoughts are certainly with the people of um, 
Louisville uh, today. Uh, you know, we've just been handed down um, uh, a, a ruling around uh, the indictment of one officer and the um, uh, shooting death of um, Breonna Taylor uh, there. Um, and the state, the city's under state of emergency. Um, and, uh, you know, my, our, our thoughts are with them. So I want to make sure I kind of note that as something that's like very relevant for uh, the conversation that we're, we're having today. I and mean, this is literally right out of, you know, the headlines and, and right out of uh, things that are bringing people into the streets um, uh, to kind of protest for, for racial justice in the country. Um, so, you know, it, it really is this context that the book is, is really trying to wrestle with. Um, so demographic changes, the legacy of racism, and Christianity's role um, really as a cornerstone of white supremacy that, that's really largely been, been overlooked. Um, but one of the things I try to do in the book is to kind of give a, a different read, a closer read of history, and uh, and connect that with contemporary public opinion data. And when we do that, it reveals um, really this as the kind of central thesis of the book, um, that, that white Christians have not just been complacent or complicit, but as the nation's dominant cultural power, white Christians have constructed and sustained a project of perpetuating white supremacy that's framed the entire American story. Um, and not only that that is true historically, but the legacy of this unholy union still lives in the DNA of white Christianity today, um, and not just among white evangelical Protestants in the South, uh, but also among uh, white mainline Protestants in the Midwest and white Catholics um, uh, in, the, in the Northeast. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned that in my, in my day job, I am, uh, the, or Tal mentioned, uh, I am the CEO of uh, Public Religion Research Institute, um, where I, I look at public opinion data um, uh, on religion, culture, and politics day in and day out. Um, but this book is also personal. I, I also grew up um, uh, as an evangelical Christian, uh, specifically as a Southern Baptist, um, in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, for the most part. And my family's history goes back six generations into middle Georgia um, there. So, so I, I try to kind of be very uh, deliberate in locating myself, I think, in the story here, along with the social science data um, and the historical data, um, you know, and, and one thing I think that makes, this is one thing that makes the book a bit unique, I think, I'm, I, I begin the book, for example, the first sentence of the book has the word I um, in it, the last sentence of the book has the word us um, in it, um, and so the, the motivations, I think, for writing the book um, really have been about casting some additional light, um, again, on this, this history that's been, um, you know, kind of in the shadows um, and, and trying to bring it out. Um, and with really a, a normative end, and that is that, you know, this history um, has, uh, in many ways, has us stuck um, as a nation. Um, we've had several opportunities to really deal with this, um, and, and this, um, you know, the, the kind of continued presence of white supremacy in American Christianity, um, but really reckoning with what this means for us today and, and for our future, I think, is a real uh, motivation uh, for, for the book, um, and really trying to find the courage in many ways to take the first step, which is uh, seeing, seeing and telling the truth. Um, and I'll, I'll wrap this kind of intro piece here with just a word from James Baldwin, um, who was actually very important uh, kind of source as I was kind of working on the book um, uh, that, that I think goes to kind of this point of kind of seeing uh, anew. Uh, you know, he, he had this great line, he says, you know, not everything that can be faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Um, so my hope, I think, is that uh, we can at least begin to take these first steps toward change um, as we face um, these really unpleasant and, um, and very difficult truths. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you again for joining us. Um, I know that Duke and I have very much enjoyed reading and discussing your work uh, over the last few weeks. And I was, I was wondering if um, you could just take a moment. Um, I, I, I know that we know that the word uh, white supremacy or white supremacy culture has been has long been used, but is now kind of it, it has been brought to the fore um, and is is used much more widely. And I was wondering if for all of us here, you can explain your use of white supremacy uh, as as it works in the book. Yeah, thanks. It's really important. So you know, it's right there in the title um, of the book. Um, but but honestly, I, I wrestled with it a little bit. Um, you know, like what the right term was to use to describe, you know, this phenomenon. And and finally, um, you know, landed on there was really no other way to accurately describe what I was talking about than to use the term 
white white supremacy. Um, and, you know, turned in the book manuscript actually well before, I think it's, it's become even in the last year, more much more commonly used in, in public uh, conversations. But but I do mean something, um, uh, it, it's important, I do spend some time unpacking it a bit in the book. And, and the main reason is this, is that I think, you know, when many particularly white or white Christian people um, hear the word white supremacy, there's an immediate kind of defensive reaction. And that is to say like, oh, that's kind of uh, violent extremists, burning crosses in people's yards or throwing bricks and uh, uh, kill, you know, lynching people and uh, wearing white sheets. And that's not me. That has nothing to do with me. Um, and, and, you know, but, but what I, I mean is, is something quite um, uh, more common uh, than that um, and, and much more widespread. Um, and it, what, what um, uh, Eddie Gloud at, at Princeton has called white supremacy without all the bluster. Um, I, I think it's a really helpful way of thinking about it. And, you know, if we just kind of take the term and we flip it around, and just try to, you know, uh, deconstruct it a little bit. And instead of saying white supremacy, if all you do is say uh, a belief in the worldview um, that really uh, uh, means that, uh, that, that supports the supremacy of whites, right? A kind of hierarchical worldview um, where, uh, where the country is set up and laws are set up to value um, and, and to promote the myth that white lives really val are, are more important um, than, than black lives or indigenous uh, lives uh, are. And, and you know, th I think there's no way of really reading American history um, straight that doesn't really see that, right? From the very beginning of the Republic where it's white landowning men, right? Who are the only people who can vote. Um, you know, whether it is, um, you know, the kind of whole history of kind of uh, voting uh, disenfranchisement, um, you know, but all the way through and in our very recent history, you know, this is not way, way back there either. So it, it, what I mean by white supremacy really is this, this um, kind of commitment to the way a, a society is organized um, uh, that, that really is about this lie uh, that white lives matter uh, more than, than black lives do. White lives are, are meant to be at the top of a pecking order, or at the top of a hierarchy. Um, and this was the normative view of white Christianity uh, for almost all of its life, um, you know, in, in the American uh, system. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I just want to say a quick word that uh, those of you who are putting questions in the Q&A will be watching for those and taking those up at a later point, just so you know our format here. Um, so I want to kind of follow up on what you just said and, and pick at it just a little more. Um, you discuss this in chapter three in your book, um, the, the tendency for people, not just in Christianity, but in all religions, to differentiate a pure form mm. of their religion that somehow doesn't have these kind of aberrations in them. Like you talked about your definition of, of white supremacy, you know, being kind of endemic, but that, that Christians often react like, Oh, that's just other people, they're extreme people, or they get the message wrong or something. But I wonder if you can talk about um, the, maybe what you think of that idea. Is it even possible to talk about a pure form of a religion mm -hmm. without the various actors that are within it who might interpret it their own ways? Can you talk to that a little? Yeah, um, it's, it's a really important distinction, I think, to, to understand. I, I think that's right. I think there is the temptation to say there is some pure form of Christianity, and every time it's been wrapped up with white supremacy, um, it's an aberration from that pure form, right, that kind of sits somewhere on a mythical shelf, uh, you know, somewhere. Um, but, you know, I think what's important is to take really seriously that, um, that what, we, what we have, right, in human institutions um, and the way that Christianity is expressed is Christianity is what Christian people do um, on the ground. Um, and if we really take that seriously, I mean, the expression of, of, of Christianity, um, we, we can't dismiss and say, oh, well, um, you know, uh, Ross Barnett, uh, for example, the governor of Mississippi, who was also the head of the men's Sunday school program at the most powerful church in the, in the state of Mississippi, um, when he was on the stump saying God is the original segregationist, uh, which is something he said quite, quite regularly on the stump, and then his church, um, after he runs a campaign uh, there, um, his church, you know, gives him uh, a, a kind of uh, a sanctification service, really, as he's being elected uh, to governor, uh, and is really right in line with 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 that that view of the world. I mean, that was a normative 
widely accepted Christian, like Orthodox Christian view um, uh, of, of, of what race looked like in, in the country and the way that whites were to be in relationship with other people. Again, it was this kind of hierarchical uh, view. And I, I think it's really important for white Christians in particular to take that seriously, um, that, that there's not a way to defend some pure form of religion um, uh, or, or to recover some pure form of religion. In fact, we have to look at the real ways that it's been lived out. And it's only when we do that, I think, that the possibility of reform uh, really even takes root, right? That we see, okay, there was some, you know, that we, if, we, if we want to make an argument that it went astray um, and that it should go somewhere else, I um, mean, that's, that's what every generation does with religious traditions, right? They kind of take something that's been received, make some decisions about what to keep, what to jettison, and what to add. Um, and so I, I think, you know, but, but I think it's very clear that what we have received still has um, assumptions of white supremacy deeply, deeply um, embedded in it. Um, and so any, any step that, uh, toward reform is going to have to take that history very, very seriously. If I can, sorry, if I can just add one little thing to that and ask you to follow up on that um, too. Um, I, you also had some survey data in your in your book about um, the the perception of Islam with regard to this mm -hmm. same thing. You know that they that Muslims have had to face the same kind of questions about bad actors within Islam. But I, didn't you also have some data that shows that Christian perception of Muslims on this question is very different than their own self perception? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is this, this double standard effect that we've able to been able to document and, and you know, again, using kind of public opinion data and, and basically in short, um, is that if you ask, uh, you know, take Dylan Roof, which I talk about in the book, um, you know, the only real way to talk about him is as a white Christian terrorist. Um, but that language hardly ever gets used. Um, I mean, he was a Lutheran uh, in good standing uh, at, a, at a Lutheran church. Um, very uh, well versed in, in Christianity, and in fact, um, uh, in his his own journals that I include some excerpts from the book um, when he was after he was arrested for murdering nine people, nine African Americans at church. Um, you know, he he's he's writing, he's drawing Christian icons um, all over this journal uh, and linking it to his white supremacist um, worldviews, right? And and yet, I think when we ask people about when people commit, uh, and this was the survey question, when people commit. Uh, acts of violence in the name of Christianity, do you think they're genuinely Christian or not? Uh, and most Christians say, no, we don't believe that about Christians who, who commit that. But when we switch the question around and we say when uh, Muslims commit uh, you know, violent acts in the name of Islam, do you think they're genuinely Muslim or not? And many more Christians are, are willing to say, yes, they're genuinely Muslim, but not apply the same yardstick. And I think part of that is part of the the issue here is, and part of what I'm, I'm kind of up to in trying to get us to tell the truth, I think, about our own history, um, is, is that is, is just exactly that, that, you know, this, this idea that, because uh, I know what, what Christians and particularly white Christians want to do too often is to take our best examples and put them up against the worst examples um, in another religion and pretend that that's a, an adequate and, and even-handed uh, comparison. Thank you. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, reading reading this book of yours, and I really enjoyed the fact Thanks. that it was um, kind of, you brought together social science and history, and I especially enjoyed that part that was part memoir, uh, which I'm guessing might have been somewhat difficult to write, either to reveal it to yourself or certainly to bring it to the public. Um, and I was wondering, just in terms of, and, and following up on that last question, uh, one of the things that you uh, talk about in, in the introduction and, and a bit throughout the book is that you had, um, I think, arrived to seminary, never really reflecting on uh, questions of, of race, not, you know, maybe even not critical race theory, to say at the very least. And I was wondering, um, you know, what mechanisms need to be in place, I guess, institutionally and, and also um, I guess, theologically, uh, that would allow you, right, to get to this point in, in, your, in your theological development, in your career, without ever really having to consider something that is so much a part, right, of American life, of American mm -hmm. history. 
Yeah, you know, it's quite remarkable um, when I when I began to reflect on this as I was working on the book um, that, um, like I said, I so I I was this kid. I was at church all the time growing up. I was uh, there. I mean, it, virtually. I mean, no kidding. Like four to five times a week. Um, if, every time the door was open, I was there all the way through. Was in the youth group. I went to a Baptist college, um, and 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 I grew up. You know, I was in elementary school in the 1970s when Jackson was going through. Um, the integration of its public schools. Now, you'll all note that that's nearly two decades after Brown v. Board of Education demanded uh, that, uh, that the public schools desegregate, but Mississippi drug its heels nearly two decades uh, through various means and finally got around to it when I was in elementary school. And so here we are going through this major event, um, and there is nothing, there's no conversation, right, in my church about these black kids showing up at my public school for the first time. And so this kind of big change for everyone, no theological framework, no commentary. Um, I, I, and and I, as I begin to reflect on this, like these stunning revelations that I never ever heard a sermon on racial justice. I never ever heard a sermon even about civil rights. Um, even as these issues were swirling all around the church and in our communities, um, I, I certainly never heard anything about the, the white church's role in resisting civil rights, or uh, maybe the most blatant example that I give in the book is I didn't even know my own denomination's history, right? Despite being at church that often and going to a Baptist college where I had to take mandatory religion classes. I had to go to chapel, you know, at, at my Baptist college. And it wasn't until I was in seminary and I had a, um, a, prof a Baptist history professor that finally told it straight and just said, look, you know, um, and that was that um, the, the origins of the Southern Baptist Convention, my home denomination, were in 1845. There was a dispute between Baptists in the North and Baptists in the South over whether uh, a clergy person uh, could uh, enslave other human beings uh, and still be a clergy person in good standing. Uh, and Baptists in the North rejected that proposition, uh, but Baptists all over the South um, accepted it, in fact, put it, put it forward as a test case, um, and then used it to uh, kind of form their own convention, and, and hence the birth of the Southern Baptist Convention. That's why that word Southern is in there. I mean, it, it was about um, making the gospel compatible with uh, enslaving other human beings. I mean, and that was, I mean, that's the origin story of my denomination, um, and we're, you know, we were no uh, small kind of fraction off on the right, um, in fact, the Southern Baptist Convention in the middle of the 20th century became the dominant uh, largest expression of white Protestant Christianity um, with 16 million members at its, at its height in the middle of the 20th century. Um, so that, so that the, the kind of dominant expression of white Christianity came from that history, which it systematically repressed, not only outwardly, but even among its own uh, its own its own people. So to to get to your question about like so what what helped? I think two things I can point to. I mean, one, uh, I do think my parents. Um, I owe a word of gratitude for putting some distance between me and the Jim Crow South that they grew up in. Um, they weren't political activists. They weren't you know um, kind of overt about it, but they definitely um, put a halt. I think to even language that we would hear from our older relatives down in Macon, Georgia. Um, and then I think the second thing, you know, we're here at an academic institution. Um, I, I think it was teachers um, that, you know, put, put books in front of me, put uh, different perspectives in front of me, and were willing to tell the truth. I mean, Leon Macbeth, who was my Baptist history professor, was the first Baptist history professor to put in a textbook uh, this history of the founding of the, uh, of the denomination, and that was in the 1980s. He was the first one to actually put that in print as, as the reason for the founding of the uh, denomination. So that's how long uh, this got hidden. But I think it's also a testimony to how powerful, um, you know, it, it was to kind of render all of that um, absolutely invisible um, to, to people who even were very active inside the, inside the, the denomination. And I'm sure it's still rendered quite invisible for many members of the denomination, which is why your book is so important. Um, so you also, you, you wrote a book prior to this called The End of White Christian America, which was very much rooted in, the, in your social scientist um, data work. Um, I'm just wondering if you could maybe briefly discuss that book and how it led to this book. Were there insights from that book that made you think, oh, I've got to write this book? How did that work? 
Yeah, thanks. Um, so that book came out in 2016. Um, and so I was writing it kind of ahead of the 2016 election. Uh, and it was really a book about demographic change and, and the way that if we really understood some of the um, kind of changing religion demographics in the country, it could help us understand some of the political divides um, in the country. So the, one of the main findings from that book really was that we had passed um, this very um, significant milestone in the country, again, that nobody was really talking about. And that was that um, just over the last decade, we have literally gone as a country from being a majority white Christian country, demographically speaking, to one that's no longer a white majority, a white Christian majority country. So, in, and when Barack Obama was running for president in 2008, um, the country was 54% uh, white and Christian. So kind of solid majority uh, white and Christian. Uh, today, that number is 44. Um, and, by, and by 2016, we had dropped just below 50%. We were around 47% in 2016, uh, around the 2016 election. And um, one of the things I think it became clear about that is that uh, part of what uh, uh, I think sort of how our, our um, particularly the, the political dynamics um, that involve kind of this intersection of religion and politics have become so shrill um, and so visceral um, has been about that demographic change, right? And so I think for so long, um, white Christians sort of equated themselves as the country, right? So white Anglo-Saxon Protestant WASP. We have this acronym uh, even, for, even for it. And that was seen to be the kind of cultural center and the cultural power um, in the country. And, and really, I think many white Protestants really did identify themselves with America. So when they heard America, they heard us, right? That we are the kind of centerpiece of America. And as that group really has shifted and, and um, has become uh, not only in terms of cultural influence, but in terms of, of numbers, no longer in the majority, um, I think it is it is created a kind of crisis, um, a kind of identity crisis. And, and then I think, uh, for example, in 2016, President Trump stepped onto that stage. And so one of the things I think the end of what Christian America did was kind of help explain this connection between particularly white evangelical voters and President Trump, which uh, was very uh, an odd match, uh, to say the least, um, given uh, what their professed values were um, going into that. But, but I think the, the real, we can say some more about this later, but the, I think the, the main thing just kind of put a pin in here is that the real, the, what, what the, the data suggests from 2016 is, is that that demographic change really was key um, and insecurities uh, from that change uh, driving attention to, to President Trump. And he did sense this, and we heard this on the, on the stump toward the end of the campaign, where he would speak to evangelical audiences and he would say, I'm going to restore power to the Christian churches. Like he was speaking directly to the sense of decline. And even his overall slogan, make America great again, right? It's that last word uh, that it really held all the power. Um, I think, particularly for white evangelicals. Um, and I've kind of argued that what he did there um, was kind of tap this, this sense of demographic change and going from majority into minority white Christian country, uh, and that white Christian voters really got um, uh, converted from being so-called values voters uh, to what I call um, uh, nostalgia voters. That is, those who are really motivated by this uh, uh, attempt to turn back the clock to really kind of a 1950s uh, America. And I think that's really the, the key here um, that kind of connects the last book um, and, and, the, and the first book is um, this vision, this kind of normative vision of a kind of mythical golden age in the 1950s. Um, and we actually have survey data on this. So, you know, we've asked one of the most predictive questions in, six, in 2016 in terms of vote was actually the question about the 1950s. And that is, do you think American culture and way of life has changed for the better or changed for the worse since the 1950s? Uh, the country is divided right down the middle on this, uh, but white Christians of all kinds, white evangelicals, white mainline, white Catholics were all on the side of saying things had changed for the worse uh, since the 1950s. And that, that and, and those who said that were highly correlated with vote for President Trump um, in the 2016 election. So it really is that connection. And so I think the new book is really taking a deeper dive because obviously what's different between the 1950s? Well, we have desegregated schools. We have the Civil Rights Acts in the 1960s. This is really the key um, cultural sea change uh, that has happened since the 1950s. And just taking a deeper dive on that and seeing just how deep, uh, particularly the, the um, resistance to 
um, racial equality uh, and the resistance to civil rights was, um, is kind of where, you know, I got led to doing the current book. Thank you. Um, I was also wondering, just following up on, uh, on, on, on your previous answer, especially as you discuss, uh, I guess, kind of how this type of rhetoric, uh, this religious rhetoric or theological rhetoric becomes politicized. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, and the truth is the two are so deeply entangled in the United States, there really is, it's very difficult, right, to separate um, this kind of, this, this uh, political and social rhetoric of evangelical Christianity and, and white supremacy. But I was wondering if you could share a little bit and, and, provide, and perhaps give us a few examples uh, about how uh, white evangelicals and perhaps others in your book um, map this worldview right onto the text, onto the Bible, right? How the Bible becomes a kind of a, a, a protector of that status quo, right? Or guards that, that worldview. Yeah, thanks. So I, I um, uh, have a, a chapter in the book where I kind of do a little theological digging on this, on this point, um, ch chapter called Believing. Um, and it is, um, you know, really interesting to kind of look at the ways in which I think really various doctrines kind of work together um, to really protect this kind of status quo, this kind of white supremacist status quo. And it shifts over time, you know, so if you, if you go back kind of pre-Civil War and you read sermons, um, you know, are in prayers uh, and, you know, for example, like the, the founder of the Southern Baptist Convention, or one of the architects of, of putting it together, was a guy named Basil Manley Sr., um, who was um, a, a kind of ordained minister, uh, had played a bunch of roles. Uh, he was also the chaplain to the Confederacy. Uh, he was the president of the um, oldest, uh, president of the board of the oldest uh, Baptist seminary, um, played just all kinds of roles. But he would very explicitly, you know, grow straight from the Bible, as many uh, did defending slavery. I mean, he, he had no qualms that kind of pulling out, you know, passage after passage, whether it was like, uh, you know, passages in, in the, uh, the Hebrew text about keeping the race, the kind of races being created separately. Um, but then there was, you know, probably the, the, some of the more explicit ones were uh, two different versions, either the curse of Cain or the curse of Ham. Uh, and literally, you know, there's this, this story early in Genesis uh, of Cain uh, mur murdering his brother Abel. Um, and, uh, and then as, as a punishment for that, uh, in the text, it says that Cain was marked. Uh, now, it doesn't say exactly what that means, um, but uh, a white supremacists, you know, Christian theologians were very quick to say, aha, this is the origin of dark-skinned people in the world, right? And so what that does immediately is, is uh, if you want to trace the lineage of uh, light-skinned Europeans through this reading, it goes back to Adam and Eve, right? The people that God uh, sort of, you know, in, in the text, uh, with with God's own hands formed, uh, you know, and then if you want to trace the origins of uh, darker skinned people in the world, uh, it doesn't go back there. It goes to a criminal, literally to a criminal act. It goes to murder, right? Uh, and so the original ancestor of dark skinned people in this in this reading uh, was a, a murderer, someone who murdered, in fact, his own brother. Um, and, and so this very easily set up a kind of a hierarchy, right? So that you have the kind of whites who are superior. Uh, have a kind of superior line lineage um, and dark-skinned people who are uh, cast as suspect right from the get-go as kind of having a deficient moral character, um, if they're even fully human. I mean, this this was a real debate whether even dark-skinned people were fully human. Um, and then and then it kind of comes up through, you know, that that's the overt stuff, but that was still being cited into the 20th century. I mean, th those those stories. So it's not that far back there. And it, thank you for that. As you map that, that theological history in Christianity, I was struck when I read it and when I listened to you again, um, the parallels when we think of aspects of Christian theology that, that fed into anti-Semitism, especially in European history, the same way that what you're mapping here has allowed white supremacy in America. It seems like there's something in Christian theology that allowed the Holocaust to happen in, in Europe and oppression of Jews. I just wonder if you, if what you think of that connection, is there a similarity there or not? Yeah, well, I, I, it's, you know, 
one thing to say is that that Christianity as kind of the dominant religion, you know, whether you're talking about in Western Europe um, or in the U.S., I mean, I think the thing about it is that it, it is the dominant cultural expression of religion, um, you know, in the society. And as such, it becomes the most powerful legitimizer of the state, uh, the most powerful legitimizer of laws, uh, the most powerful legitimizer of norms um, in, in culture. Um, and so it plays this role. And so it, 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 it is, um, you know, something that I think people can draw on. And we, we see this drawn both for reform movements and for repression. Um, so I, I think it, it's absolutely there. But, but this sense, again, that, you know, that, that white Christians um, that, ha that have their origins in Europe, and, you know, you can go back to um, even prior to the Protestant Reformation, um, to the, um, the Doctrine of Discovery in 1493, right? We have a papal edict that says, um, look, if, if uh, Christian uh, explorers or missionaries come across uh, lands that are occupied by non-Christians, they can forcibly take those lands, right? That, that is a legitimate thing uh, for uh, Christians to do, and it has a, it has a religious legitimization uh, behind it. It is part of God's will for the civilization of the world. I mean, that's the way that that argument went. Um, and so I think that, you know, that's, that, that lands on American shores, um, even though it's a kind of papal edict from hundreds of years before, and manifest destiny, uh, and pushing indigenous people off the land, um, and, 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 and kill, killing them and forcibly removing them. Uh, it, it's, it's under the hood, um, way, way back. Um, so I, I think there is sort of those resources there, and it's about um, a kind of domination and about a kind of certainty that God is really on the side of white Europeans, right? Uh, as a privileged people um, that have a special role. Um, and so uh, as they're inheriting that special role, part of it is um, actually, it, it is literally domination as part of their uh, God-given role. And that's the way that it was, it was really understood. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of, again, take that history very, very seriously. Um, I, I guess following up on uh, these questions that, that deal with theology, um, you speak a lot in your text uh, about the relationship between American Christians and a more uh, personal Jesus. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, who is kind of this figure of Jesus uh, that, uh, they, that American evangelicals have a relationship with and is he imagined, and this also goes to the, the kind of response that you gave in terms of the you know, previous election and, um, and kind of this, uh, I guess, affinity towards Trump, right? Is this imagined Jesus is, is you know, that the Jesus that they imagine, right? Uh, is, is he just like them, right? Who is he? You know, is yeah. he American evangelical in, in many ways? Well, you know, it's, it's a great question. I mean, what, one might think um, in 2020 that we were well beyond um, insisting on uh, the fact that Jesus was white and of European descent. Um, you know, um, I, I, if for no other reason that you, you can't really be a biblical literalist and think that um, uh, consistently. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, I mean, on Twitter last month, there was a big fight um, over Eric Metaxas, who uh, declared that Jesus was white. Um, like just flat out put it out there, right? And this is a best-selling author in the evangelical world. It's no like small kind of, you know, sideshow uh, person. This is somebody very central uh, there. And, and so this is surprisingly still very much with us, um, you know, today. And this, you know, uh, this idea um, that, that, um, that Jesus was white is actually kind of integral um, to the way that I think Jesus was understood, particularly around uh, this, this, what you mentioned, this kind of personal relationship with Jesus. I mean, if there was anything that I heard uh, growing up in, in virtually, you know, probably every service, um, may, maybe, I mean, very few exceptions out of thousands of services I went to, it was that phrase, personal relationship with Jesus. Like that phrase was there all the time. Um, and it was so central. And, and what, what it, um, I think the, the challenge with it is that it really does reduce um, Christianity to be only about that, right? And so the beginning and the end of religiosity is about this kind of cultivating this personal, interior, individual relationship with Jesus. 
Um, and uh, the, the problem with that, I think, is that it, it's, is, is for what it screens out, right? So what it allows white Christians to do is to sit very secure in a, in a kind of interiorized um, uh, a version of religion and be completely blind to injustice all around them and, and, and completely indifferent. Uh, to injustice all around them. And I, I sort of speak, you know, that from experience. Again, that I, again, I grew up feeling quite comfortable in my own relationship with Jesus um, and that, and that in the church um, without even thinking about, um, you know, what I was seeing all around me in Jackson, Mississippi. And, and without even making the, even when I was aware of the injustices, not making the connection that that was an appropriate thing to think theologically about or to think religiously about um, you know, on this point, I think Martin Luther King had it exactly right. You know, in, in Letter from Birmingham Jail, and he wrote in 1963, um, he was in Birmingham, get arrested, he's in jail, he writes this piece, and he, he, he addresses it not to the extremists, again, not to the KKK cross-burning, you know, folks who are doing violence. He addresses it to the, you know, what are people who see themselves as mainstream religious institutions, like the kind of respectable civic leaders of, of the of the of the city um, and he's just dismayed right at their silence and their inability to stand up on the right side of history on the right side of civil rights and he has this really excruciating line where he says who are these christians sitting safely behind their anesthetizing stained glass windows and i think that that phrase is exactly you know um very much right um it's a great metaphor that and and what we really see is that that version of that interior that kind of individual relationship with Jesus, one of the things it does is it does kind of put white Christians' consciences to sleep uh, with regard to social justice and systemic injustice. Uh, it renders them basically invisible and irrelevant uh, for what it means to be to be Christian. Um, and you know certainly if you read the rest of the biblical text, it's a very odd way of sort of thinking about Christianity, but but I think that's the way it functions. And if you think about where it came from, this is by design, right? So I, I was a computer science major under in my undergrad, and um, to put it into that language, it's a feature, not a bug, right? Um, this is not something gone wrong uh, with white Christianity, but it, it's actually built in uh, on purpose. And that is to say, if, you know, if the, if the truth is that white Christians were first committed to uh, a view of society that protected their lives and valued their lives more than others uh, through segregation or Jim Crow laws, um, uh, you know, any things we, number of things we could name, then all of the theology, all of the practices have to develop around that a priori commitment, right? They have to be built around that. And so one of the things that this conveniently does um, is, uh, again, allow there to be very little cognitive dissonance, right? That, that you just separate injustice out there with piety in here. Um, and and it, it, it just renders, it, there's almost no place to get any traction um, on that. It, it's almost an airtight um, you know, kind of system and, and, and by design, right? Because that allows white Christians to continue on week after week, year after year, being completely indifferent uh, to what's going on outside those stained glass windows. Uh, so I, I was going to ask a follow-up to that, but I'm going to try instead to start to fold in, as I'm noticing the time, some of the uh, questions uh, from our Q&A. So uh, kind of taking it in a different direction, but again, following up on this kind of um, image of Jesus or this kind of relationship with Jesus, um, but bringing into it kind of a different manifestation of, of belief, which, right, material culture, and this is one of the questions um, that was sent into us, uh, I was wondering kind of how you think um, kind of certain um, renderings of paintings, music, theater um, of Jesus as white, right, with kind of long flowing, blonde, you know, blonde hair and blue eyes, and um, even sometimes with kind of very kind of pastoral uh, Bavarian hills yeah. behind him. Um, right? How does kind of how did this? How does the material culture? How do these renderings of Jesus um, influence the relationship between holiness and whiteness? Yeah, it's it's vitally important. Um, and I, yeah, I should note if you really understand the, the most common image that maybe all of us have in our head, if you're kind of just conjuring it right now, um, is probably the image painted by an artist named Salman, um, and it's actually a Swedish 
Jesus, if we want to be like really clear about it, um, it was actually painted for a Swedish youth magazine um, uh, early on um, and then just kind of took off and, and, and mostly get took off. It got re reproduced millions of times as World War II soldiers were leaving off for war. Um, the Salvation Army and others were reproducing this in little postcard form for soldiers to take off to the trenches um, with them. And then they brought it back home. It is the painting you see on many, many a church wall. Uh, but it is liter literally a Scandinavian uh, Jesus. Um, you know, by, by design, it was, it was meant for that community. Uh, and then it just escaped as this kind of normative, you know, white Jesus. But he's literally got kind of lighter hair. He's got blue eyes, um, very light skin. Um, but if you take that personal relationship seriously, um, that piece too, uh, there is a way in which that's so intimate um, that it would really break down, uh, for example, if for many white people, if we really imaged uh, what, what Jesus probably looked like, right, as a Middle Eastern Jew, um, he's not going to look like the guy from Scandinavia. Um, uh, but, but having this kind of personal, intimate, and even the language, right, um, I'm going to let Jesus come into my heart. Um, right, that language that is used so often in evangelicals, um, that fits pretty well if, you, if you're white and you see that white Jesus. But if you're looking at an image of Jesus that is like a Middle Eastern, Jewish, um, darker skinned, uh, you know, coarser hair, this language of letting that guy come into your heart if you're white, uh, it's going to be a, a bit different, right? Because it's, it's not your, uh, your group. Um, and so I, I think it's been really important at cementing this sense that uh, whites are, again, the kind of privileged uh, racial group. Uh, they're meant to be at the top of the pecking order. Um, and if Jesus was white, if the son of God was white, um, uh, then of course, right, um, I, we can conclude from that that, that, that our people group um, is, is superior. So I, I think it's been really, really important to kind of break that down. Um, I did a little thing too just recently about um, – kind of Googling uh, kind of crash images or nativity scenes, see the same thing. Um, the, the only brown people in it, and most of those nativity scenes are uh, perhaps one of the wise men. Um, uh, everyone else is pretty much white. Certainly the angels are white, the baby Jesus is white. Um, and I, I think that iconography, even if it's very passive and we don't think about it, it, it shapes our vision of reality. It shapes our vision of who God is. Um, and it's absolutely something, um, uh, certainly one concrete place to start, I think, for kind of dismantling white supremacy and white Christian churches is taking down that picture of white Jesus from the hallway. I think um, going, maybe tapping into that same bit about um, Christian self-awareness on these kinds of things, because what, a lot of what you're talking about is you know, implicit or subconscious, but it's things that are very real to these people. But one of the um, data points you cite in, in your book is that white evangelical Christians will, will score one of the highest when asked a question like, how do they feel about African Americans? Like, do they have warm feelings? and they will score the highest. And yet when you shift the question to more specific, practical kinds of things, the score shifts. And I wonder if you could just explain that data point for people who haven't read that. Yeah, um, so this is kind of from the core social science chapter um, in the book. And um, you know, one of the challenges of kind of measuring opinion um, on racism uh, or uh, you know, racist attitudes is, is that you can't just ask people directly so do you consider yourself, you know, a racist or a bigot? Um, you know, you have to kind of really think about how to ask this carefully to get a legitimate um, answer. So one of the things I did in the book is I um, used a combination of 15 different questions to kind of build up that were really about structural racism to kind of build up a set of attitudes um, that I combined in a thing I call the racism index. Um, and so uh, they, these cover a lot of ground from Confederate flags and symbols uh, to criminal justice, uh, perceptions of criminal justice, uh, treatment of African Americans, police treatment of African Americans, uh, general economic mobility, et cetera, um, here. And, and one of the things that I, I did find is exactly this, this um, kind of uh, very paradoxical thing is that when I use that, that racism index, which is really measuring structural rate, kind of perceptions of structural racism um, and a willingness to see it or ability to see it in the country, um, I do find, um, uh, and we've been talking a lot about evangelicals, but I should say here, 
um, that one of the more surprising things in the book is that um, while I did find, for example, on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is holding the most racist attitudes on this racism index, uh, that white evangelicals scored eight out of 10, right? So quite high um, on this index, but also white mainline Protestants, that is Episcopalians, Presbyterians, uh, and United Methodists scored seven out of 10 um, on this racism index. And white Catholics who have their own history of, of uh, persecution in the country also scored uh, seven out of 10. And if you compare them to whites who aren't Christian, uh, whites who are unaffiliated only scored four um, out of 10, uh, and African-Americans scored two um, out of 10. So there's this kind of great chasm between white Christians of all kinds, not just evangelicals uh, here, uh, on, and African-Americans on issues of structural racism. But that's quite different than if you just ask people, well, do you feel warmly or coolly toward African-Americans? Uh, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why we miss this um, uh, so often in the analysis is that if we only look at how people are self-reporting kind of personal racism issues, and, and they are self-reporting, right? Um, so there's an incentive all, always to kind of overstate the case. Um, and, and we do find white, this kind of thing, white evangelicals are simultaneously the group that is the most likely uh, to report warm feelings for African-Americans, and they are the group that is the most likely to, uh, score, or to score the highest on the racism index um, at the same time. Um, I mean, I think uh, and it, you have um, a section, that it might be in, in chapter five, perhaps chapter four, uh, where you discuss monuments. And I wanted to follow up to that previous question in terms of the data points. And I think one place where you can see this, and I'm especially thinking of places like Stone Mountain, Georgia, right, where each night there's a laser light show, right, where there's this deep entanglement of the rising of the South again, kind of the resurrection of Christ, right, a certain type of uh, political narrative or national narrative. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about right, how these types of monuments, right, which bring together an evangelical Christian worldview and an American political narrative, right, might inform, right, this difference in the kind of social scientific data, right, where the feelings are, no, no, of course, I'm not racist, right, but on the other hand, and, and yes, I am kind of a, a good uh, and loving Christian, right, but on the other hand, right, there are certain narratives, um, kind of certain images that remain kind of sacred. Um, and if yeah. you talk about, you know, this use of monuments and the like. Right. So, I mean, you know, this is part of this moment of reckoning that we're in over racial justice has to do with um, Confederate monuments. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's a great amount of ignorance about um, the origins of these monuments uh, is the first thing to say, right, is that, you know, I think many times these debates, uh, um, people assume that they were put up during the Civil War or immediately after the Civil War. Right. Um, but if you pay attention to when they're put up, it tells a different story. And most of these were actually put up in the 20th century. Uh, they were put up uh, and there's a big spike in the 1920s. And what's going on there is that that's exactly when also there were Jim Crow laws being kind of erected everywhere um, as whites were kind of reasserting, kind of overthrowing Reconstruction and reasserting their dominance and suppressing African-Americans voting, uh, kind of putting in these um, kind of strong segregationist laws. And they're dotting the landscape with these monuments at the same time, right? These are literally testimonies to white dominance um, in, in that context. And we see a, a, a spike there. And the other, the other uh, spike we see is in the 1950s uh, of these monuments kind of being erected. And what's going on there? Well, it's Brown v. Board of Education and desegregation. So when there are these moments of movement uh, toward civil rights, toward more equality, um, uh, there is this kind of reassertion of marking the landscape. I mean, it's very kind of visceral um, out there. And, uh, and, and it was very explicit. I mean, the, the, the group that um, is responsible for, you know, over 1,500 of these monuments um, around us was the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, they were very powerful women's group. There was over 100,000 of them um, at their, in their heyday in the early part of the 20th century. And so most of the monuments that we see around us uh, today are really due to them, including Stone Mountain. Um, uh, and, and just a quick word about Stone Mountain. It is bigger than Mount Rushmore. I mean, it is massive, um, uh, you know, and it has, it has the Trinity. It's got Lee, uh, Jackson, and Davis, um, right, uh, which became actually functioned as a kind of Confederate Trinity and was often overlaid 
with God the Father, the God the Son, and the Spirit. I mean, there was really this kind of entanglement of kind of Christian Trinitarian theology onto these Confederate um, Confederate leaders. So it's all wrapped up very, very tightly there. Um, and one thing to say is this, is that we have seen some movement um, over the summer uh, in support of the Black Lives Movement. It has flagged a little bit over the last month. But when we, we, we did go back in the field and ask um, some questions around Confederate monuments and flags this summer, um, and I should report, I mean, it's, it, it is remarkable. This is one place where white Christians are actually digging in. Their attitudes have actually gotten more toward the side of saying these are part of Southern heritage and not about racism. Um, so we've actually seen uh, over the summer, um, those, those views are actually higher than they were even, la even last year um, when, we last, when we last measured them. So we're seeing a kind of doubling down and, and the president is doubling down on Confederate monuments and flags, right? Very explicitly. And so I, th I think we're seeing some of that following his lead um, of, of just denying that they're about racism and um, and doubling down on the fact that they're are seeing them or declaring them to be just about a southern pride or heritage and not about not about racism. Sounds like more of the unfortunate polarization we're going through right now. Yeah. Um, we we have a lot of very interesting questions coming in, so we're we're going to try to take many of those up now. Um, one of them is. Uh, the, the question has a concern for African Americans who are Christian, and, and not just Christians, but um, because of, the, of Christianity being a result of colonization and slavery in African American history. So their question is, how do Black people purge their, their culture of this toxicity mm -hmm. as part of decolonization and emancipatory work? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's complex. Um, I and mean, I'll say I was even on a call um, a few weeks ago with an African American minister who said, uh, for example, that he um, got into a huge fight with the person coordinating his Sunday school um, at his church, an African American uh, church, um, as an older woman who had been doing Sunday school forever, but she was ordering materials uh, from Broadman Press, um, which is uh, the Southern Baptist press. It was providing Sunday school materials for their church. Um, and, and I should say also the word Broadman is a combination of uh, the last names John Broadus and Basil Manley, all right, um, two uh, slave-owning founders of the Southern Baptist Convention, um, for which the press is even named. But, you know, all the materials had white people for the most part, even in the illustrations, uh, it had a very explicit kind of white Christian perspective. Um, on here. So I, I think it, it is complex. There's still, there's still white Jesuses hanging in African American churches uh, today, right? I think that's another sort of piece of it uh, as well. On the other hand, I, mean, I will say that um, Black Christians very quickly um, did something different with the raw materials of Christianity uh, than their white counterparts did once they got independence and once they got out from under um, those. Uh, a quick story here, the, the Perhaps the kind of the most uh, egregious example that will make this clear is um, I, I write in the book about um, a, a, a Bible that I came across that's in the permanent collection of, the, of Fisk University. Uh, it's kind of dubbed the Slave Bible. And basically, it was a, a Bible created um, by kind of white Christians in London for use with missionaries with enslaved people in the British West Indies. Um, so missionaries, other clergy who were um, uh, kind of uh, being ministers to en enslaved people in those countries or uh, in, in those islands were using this, this Bible and they've been handed out. And what was unique about it is that it had been uh, selectively chopped down. And so it, it excluded, for example, about 90 percent of the Hebrew text, um, including all the prophets. Um, and it excluded about half of the New Testament. Uh, and it wasn't just random. It was very uh, deliberate. And I think this will tell you something about the different directions that white Christianity and black Christianity have gone, um, is what they excised. Um, uh, again, all the prophets, so let justice roll down like waters, righteousness is a mighty stream, not in that text. Um, and even the book of Exodus, which was included um, in there, which is, great, of course, the great story of liberation, uh, they, uh, the, the Ten Commandments are in there, the story of the Israelites' enslavement is there, but the story of their liberation was cut. 
right? So even, even though the book was continued to be called Exodus, like literally, you know, um, freedom, um, the, the story of the liberation was gone. And in the New Testament, uh, Ephesians, slaves obey your masters was there. Uh, but Galatians, in Christ, there is no slave nor free, no Jew nor Greek was gone. Uh, right. And so it's kind of very, the book of Revelation was gone. Anything that might have been kind of tools for, for, um, for that. And so I think one of the things that, that we do see is that in general, uh, you know, African-American Christians have reclaimed those pieces that were denied them uh, in these early texts and in these early settings. Uh, so the other thing to say is that, you know, the, the early church setting of the Republic uh, in, in America was white uh, folks uh, bringing enslaved people to church with them. Right. And so if you take seriously that context, um, then, you know, and you ask what could be preached in that setting, what could be prayed in that setting, what what rituals could be done um, in that setting, you get you get a sense of just how narrow I think the, the white Christian in pra lived white Christianity in practice um, had become again because of this a priori commitment uh, to white to white supremacy. Um. Following up on that, another question that has come in to our Q&A um, asks uh, kind of what, what is the leadership of some of the uh, conser more conservative Orthodox Christian churches uh, which you critique? How are they responding uh, to these kind of this, these theological questions that you're raising and also then to your, to your book? And um, this is a yeah. few questions on this topic kind of put together. Yeah, um, so, so far, um, I haven't gotten a lot of response, um, you know, from, from most of those, uh, from, like, say, from Southern Seminary or from First Baptist Church in Jackson or some of the other places where I kind of delve into the history. Um, I, 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 I hope that I'll, I'll get that. Um, I have done some, you know, some things. That last night, I did something with the Atlanta History Center. Um, I did one uh, piece a month ago with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Um, you know, so I have sort of been in Southern contexts where there's been, a, I think, a fairly receptive um, audience. Uh, it's it certainly, I think, what I hear mostly from those um, uh, audiences is, is, is something that I think would be true for me if you'd asked me some of these questions even, you know, three years ago before I started working on the book is like, man, I, I just never knew. I, I never knew this, you know, this history. This is not something I know about. Um, and so I'm going to have to think about that. I think it takes people a little bit of back and a little bit off guard. Um, uh, so, but, but there hasn't been a great deal of, of pushback. It's been mostly um, kind of quiet on that front, um, at least so far. Thank you. Okay, we're getting a few questions with a similar theme, um, which I know won't surprise you, but like, what do we do with this <laughs> kind of question? Yeah. You know, how do we move forward from here? And I think the, the questions are showing different levels to that, you know, um, what, you know, what can be done in terms of just theology, but also are there practical ways of, you know, bringing your book to larger audiences, things like that. So uh, I'm sure you've been asked a lot, you know, what, what's the solution? Where do we go? So, yeah. Well, I, I can, I'll start by saying, you know, um, it's interesting, there was, when I was working on the book, I, I, in talking with various people about kind of how the book was going to get constructed and what was going to be in the book, um, I did get a, a few folks kind of pushing, you know, for a kind of practical 10-step program um, at the, you know, as the last chapter of the book. Um, and I, I resisted that for a couple of reasons, principal, uh, the principal reasons, I, I don't really have a 10-step program, um, so I would have had to just make one up. Um, but, but I do in the book, um, uh, you know, so, so the book does kind of have an arc to it. The, the first uh, chapter is called Seeing, S-E-E-I-N-G. The last chapter is called Reckoning. Um, so trying to kind of go from, I, I think the first thing that has to happen is that we have to be able to see this history and we have to have the courage, I think, to name it uh, and to tell the truth. So I think that is the first thing. Back to that early quote, quote from Baldwin, not everything that can be faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So I think the first thing is just uh, naming it. And, you know, for people who are white and Christian out there, like me, um, you know, one practice I did that make this like super practical um, is I just spent a little bit of time journaling. Um, and I asked myself a question that really only people who have grown up thinking of themselves as white uh, can ask. And that is, 
So where does race show up for me when I think about my childhood, uh, when I think about my adolescence? Like, where does it appear? Like, where, where can I even surface it? I mean, it's a, it's a sort of nonsensical question for non-white uh, folks, but, but for white folks, I think because of the power of its invisibility, um, uh, that this is a serious question. Uh, and it, what I found is that once I just spent a little bit of time with that and started kind of pulling that thread, more came, right? Um, but it took a little bit of kind of priming the pump and getting it going. Uh, and then I was like, oh yeah, that and that and that. And then the kind of pizza started coming uh, together. So I think that's part of it. And then I think another part of it is telling telling stories um, to people in our in your friendship group. So, uh, you know, with, with and just a quick example from my own life to be, make it really personal, um, you know, I, I, I did not send the manuscript to my parents until it was done um, because I really wanted to kind of make sure I just had it all there and then wanted to have a conversation with them. But, but when I did have a conversation with them, other stories came uh, from my parents and some of which I'm sure I, my parents would have gone to their grave without telling me. Um, so for, for example, um, I only found out after, uh, after the, again, the book was wrapped uh, for my parents that uh, so there was this practice in the 1960s. Um, uh, in fact, one of the things that Medgar Evers was doing, um, the last things he was doing before he was killed and assassinated was trying to integrate churches in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and, uh, and so there was this practice to resist that, that actually ended up using uh, deacons essentially as bouncers on the outside steps of the churches um, to prevent any African Americans or mixed race groups from coming into the sanctuary to worship. Um, and I, I found out, um, you know, that my grandfather had been one of those people um, stationed outside on the, on the church steps. Um, you know, so kind of just getting a, a firmer sense of that history. Um, other, other kinds of things that are really practical, I, I think if every white church would ask, you know, even have a, have a conversation um, uh, uh, and, and ask themselves, why is our church geographically located where it is? Um, it would vary very quickly get to race in almost all cases. If it's an older church, um, it's most likely, and it's a white, been a predominantly white church, it's most likely in a neighborhood that was declared a whites only neighborhood uh, by redlining practices, um, uh, you know, that, that were really, really rampant. Um, if, if it's a newer church and it's out in the suburbs, why this suburb, um, right? Why did it land here? Not Why not back in the city? Well, probably because it's, it's following affluent white flight out into the suburbs or the exurbs, and that's an easy place to plant a church if you're going to minister just to white people. Um, so kind of asking those questions, I think, uh, really seriously. And then I, lastly, I think just um, figuring out um, how to be in community, because I, I think this can all be very abstract. Um, but one of the things I think that, and the, one of the reasons why I think these divides have continued to be as big as they are, is because there is such a lack of community between white and black Christians. Um, in the country. I mean, we still have about 85% of the churches today are, are uh, essentially monoracial uh, churches, deeply, deeply segregated. Um, this thing that Martin Luther King said about 11 a.m. Sunday morning being the most segregated hour in America, still largely true um, today. And so building some bridges there, and the reason why I think that's going to matter, and I talk about two churches in Macon, Georgia, um, that have done this work. Um, the reason that matters is then the, the problem comes from being abstract to one that is relational, um, right? And so um, if, and then you, you can ask a question like this, like, so on the question of the killing of African-American men by police, when there's this huge gap between African-American views and white Christian views, I mean, there's, there's like a 50 to 60 point gap between those two uh, views, that ought to be a scandal um, in the Christian church, right? That white and black Christians are so far apart. And I think, you know, one of the things that if, if white Christians are in relationship, it's much easier to ask the question, okay, um, even if I don't understand it, we're talking about Breonna Taylor or George Floyd or you know, some of these other things, even if I don't understand the reactions that I'm seeing in the streets, um, if I see my fellow African-American brothers and sisters in pain and anguish, uh, angry, I ought to just stop and sit with that for a while and try to understand it, right? And, and if you're in relationship, you're motivated to do that, not by some, you know, highbrow principle, but because, out of love, right? It, it's out of wanting to be in relationship with people and to understand their pain and understand their suffering. And I, I think we're, there's a great deficit of that uh, going on right now. And, and 
but it takes kind of building those bridges and building those relationships um, to kind of help you know build that in. So I, I think it is very much on the ground, local communities, pastors, congregations, kind of slowly building these bridges. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think that's where the real lasting change is going to happen. Um, another question that, or I guess two questions um, that I'll put together that we have coming in, um, and a, a question that I have as well is, right, how can we uh, relate this, right, to discussions of patriarchy or, or the question of gender, right? So could this also be a moment for a reckoning of a legacy of patriarchy, right? If we're talking about white supremacy culture um, and kind of this reckoning that you are presenting, right, is this another piece of that puzzle and how can we use this kind of 10 step uh, program that you've just mentioned, you know, somewhat in, in jest, it's brilliant though, right, how can we move it into that realm as well? Yeah, it's a great question. It, and I think it's important to realize that, um, you know, this hierarchical worldview that I've mentioned a few times, um, it, it, it wasn't just racial, right? There were other hierarchies. Um, and one of the most, one of the principal ones was men over women. Um, right, so it's white over black, male over female, parents over children, um, and it, it, it and humans over uh, non-human animals. I mean, it is very much a kind of um, all the way down hierarchical view um, with white men um, at the top of it. So patriarchy is absolutely wrapped up um, in in white supremacy because it's all part of this worldview. Um, and again, what what's behind it all is the sense that. Uh, that there's a kind of divine mandate, right, for white men to be at the top of that pyramid. And, and everybody kind of has their role, but if you're not white and you're not male, um, and I should add, if you're not straight, um, you know, then your role is subservient to those people who are, right? And so I think dismantling white supremacy is by definition going to mean pulling out the supports uh, from these other kinds of hierarchical worldviews um, at the same time. Okay, um, so I'm going to also combine a couple questions here um, that kind of relate to something you were, I think you were mentioning it in chapter two, but um, that relates to kind of differences within Christianity. So there, there are some denominations that are coming out with some official statements, for example, against white supremacy, trying to take their people in a direction that's prophetic but you talk about the difference between those official statements and the people in the pews, what's actually going on. And kind of linked to that, a question that came in is, you know, there are churches all over the country that you could pick out now that are talking about social justice and mm -hmm. trying to address this problem. So how do people kind of on the other side of that view their fellow Christians who, who are doing the, these things, you know, are, are, they, are they getting it wrong or, you know, so talk about those divisions between officials and the people in the pews and then between different forms of Christianity. Yeah, uh, well, I'll take the, yeah, that kind of denominational statements. And um, I, I think one of the least effective things denominations can do is issue statements. Um, I, I think, you know, in terms of kind of changing behaviors on the ground, uh, it's just very, very clear. Um, I, we haven't talked a lot about um, Catholicism, but I'll, I'll talk here about Catholicism. So U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, for decade after decade would put out statements on racial inequality. Um, and then a decade later, they put out another statement on racial inequality. And the preamble to that statement would always basically say, we put out the statement 10 years ago, not a lot seems to have changed. So we're, here we are again, kind of talking about this. So, and if you read them, um, a lot of the admonitions, you know, are admirable. Um, they talk about equality, talk about racism as a sin, even talk about structural racism um, as sinful. But what was very clear, and uh, uh, Professor Massengale um, uh, has, has done like the really great work on this, you know, found that it almost never got down to the pews. Um, in fact, in a 2014 uh, a survey are, uh, that, you know, found that uh, in the in three years of preaching through the lectionary of, of the Bible, um, that overwhelming majorities of Catholics reported that they heard absolutely nothing uh, from a Catholic priest on racial justice in three years. So that means that in preaching through virtually every piece of the biblical text over a three-year period, uh, most priests found not one occasion 
uh, to preach on racial justice. Uh, and I, and that, that, you know, could, you could multiply the, uh, you know, the things uh, in, in the United Methodist Church, um, you know, uh, was actually the, the place that, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, and, and the National Council of Churches had uh, Martin Luther King speak. They, uh, the Christian Century magazine, which is mainline Protestant magazine, was the one who first published letter from Birmingham jail. I um, mean, at the same time they're doing that, um, there's an Episcopalian, the Lovett School, uh, an Episcopalian school in Atlanta is, uh, is denying admission to Martin Luther King's son on the basis of race. Right, so you have these kind of, you know, vast disconnects between the denominational, you know, piece and things on the pews. So that's why I think it really, I, I think that that those statements are, you know, they're symbols, right? But they don't get the work done. They have to be kind of pushed down to the local, um, uh, down down to the local community. That's why I was kind of emphasizing that in the, um, on the other statement. Remind the second part was what again? Uh, so that's the kind of top-down denominational congregational piece. Uh, the second piece was just um, when there are congregations that are focusing on social justice yeah. issues, but then others aren't, how do they look at each other? Yeah, um, well, uh, probably askance um, a bit. Um, uh, you know, one of the, I think that things that we've certainly seen in the religious landscape is that we used to think about um, the fault lines in the religious landscape running along denominational lines. Um, you know, so Presbyterians versus Me Methodists, Catholics versus Protestant, like that kind of thing. Um, what we've increasingly seen uh, really over the last few decades, it's been a while now, um, rather than that, we're, we're more and more seeing that the fault lines are political fault lines that run through denominations, right? Um, so they're racial and they're political and they're partisan, uh, you know, the, these partisan fault lines that run. So, you know, liberal uh, liberal and uh, conservative Presbyterians, uh, you know, may have uh, less in common uh, than a liberal Presbyterian and a liberal Catholic, uh, you know, might have uh, today. And so I think we're seeing these divides, you know, be quite, quite serious. And, and this issue of race and racial justice looks like it's shaping up to be a very serious uh, fault line, not only in our partisan landscape, but, but on, among the kind of landscape in our churches. And this kind of fight over um, you know, whether we tell this kind of history or whether we tell a rosier, uh, what's often called a more patriotic, you know, version of our history, um, that's a real serious fight um, right now. Um, also in our questions is that if you were writing this book, I guess, uh, more recently, uh, even than you have, um, are there events that you wish you could have addressed, um, such as the uh, they write the current Black Lives Matter movement or the upcoming election. You know, what would you say to those? Yeah, you know, so, so in the book, I mean, the, the big touchstones I talk on are, um, you know, the Charlottesville uh, marches, um, Dylan Roof, um, you know, murdering African Americans in, in, in Charleston, um, and, and some of the earlier Black Lives movement around Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, um, uh, and even Trayvon. Um, so I do talk about like that piece of it, but uh, it is remarkable when I, so I turned in the manuscript of this book almost exactly a year ago. Um, and I could not have imagined, you know, the events of, of the spring and the summer and, and the current moment that we're, that we're in. I, 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 I really didn't foresee it. Um, but I'll, I'll say this though, that I'm, I'm actually, um, despite how difficult I think and this summer has been, um, uh, I'm actually a little more hopeful um, than I was when I turned the manuscript in. Um, and, and here's why I can point to a couple of things. One is um, I spent a fair amount of time in Richmond um, doing research for the book. In fact, at, like at the headquarters, of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, for example, and, and kind of taking in the monuments. And I remember, you know, just a year ago, walking down Monument Avenue, out, heading west out of downtown Richmond and passing these, you know, five massive uh, monuments to the Confederacy. And four of the five of the principal statues at the center of those monuments are now gone, uh, right? And, and even the one that's left is now spray painted with racial justice and Black Lives Matter, you know, slogans here. I, there's no way I would have, those monuments have been there for over a hundred years, right? They survived the civil rights movement. Uh, they, you know, they've just been there and now, and now they're not. I think that's something quite significant. Um, and the other thing um, I would say is e even in, in my uh, denominate, home denomination I grew up in, the Southern Baptist Convention, even there, a few glimmers of hope, I think. Um, in Richmond, for example, there's a, a First Baptist Church is also right there um, uh, near one of the monuments. 
And, uh, and that church um, has, uh, you know, a very long history of being committed to white supremacy. They actually offered their church bell to the Confederate army to be melted down to make cannons out of in the, in the Confederate, um, uh, in, in the Civil War. Uh, it wasn't taken, so they kept their bell. Uh, but when the statue was being removed on the traffic circle that's right across the street from their church, one of the church members um, uh, asked if they could ring the bell celebrating the removal of this monument, right? So when you have this arc of a church that offered its bell to support slavery, um, now ringing that same bell 150 years later um, to mark the, the removal of the symbol uh, of white supremacy, I, I think there's something quite important going on. And then my home state of Mississippi, um, the Mississippi Baptist Convention actually called on the governor and the legislature to take out the Confederate battle flag from the state's flag. Also something I never would have imagined that got put up for referendum 19 years ago and easily passed uh, with the Baptist Convention saying absolutely nothing uh, about it. And, and this time they actually took a stand and, and called on the governor to remove it as a divisive a symbol and a symbol of racism. Um, so again, stuff I wouldn't imagine. I, I, are we there yet? Absolutely not. Um, but you know, do I see some things happening that um, I would have had a hard time imagining uh, a year ago? Like absolutely. I'm glad to hear there's some bright spots there. And and those those of you who haven't read the book um, should know that you know you do wrap up with some examples of people who are trying things and trying to reckon with all of this. One of our questions. Um, they want to know, even though you've been mostly concerned with evangelicals and white um, mainline Protestants and Catholics, do, do you have any insight into like Eastern branches of Christianity in America or, or even, you know, maybe other religions as far as this race issue goes? Yeah, well, I, I don't have a lot of data on that. Um, the main reason is that we just don't have the sample size and the surveys that we were using to kind of pull that out in a statistically um, significant way. Um, you know, one thing I'll say, but, you know, certainly um, there, there are, um, I think, broader tools. Um, one of the things that um, you know, I've learned a lot from Michael Emerson um, and his colleagues in talking about, uh, you know, some of these things we, we talk about, like this kind of individualism um, as being kind of part of a cultural toolkit uh, for evangelicals. Um, and I think one of the things that many, many Eastern traditions have um, and, uh, and, and, and Judaism has is uh, is a broader toolkit that has more social tools in it, right? More ability to see uh, the connections between things, to see institutional uh, and systemic injustice. Um, I think those tools are, are more there. And, and so, for example, if you look at the way just Judaism, which is a tradition I probably know the best um, outside of Christianity, that, that, you know, the way that African Americans read the book of Exodus is very similar to the way that Judaism reads. Uh, the book of Exodus, right? Very much, it's, cent it's more central to their understanding of the faith, um, and that theme of liberation, um, you know, really does shape, I think, um, the center um, of, of, of the religion in ways that are, I think, very palpable, even to individual members, like, down on the ground. Um, when, when reading your book, and I know that we don't have a lot of time left, but I was, I was, it seemed like you framed your consideration of the question of race uh, for yourself kind of in those more memoir-esque aspects as a sort of conversion experience. Um, and I was wondering if this book is supposed to be a kind of, um, I don't know if it's a prophetic book or a, a narrative of a conversion experience with hard data to support it. Um, or, you know, is it a tool to evangelize other uh, American Christians to support this type of reckoning of race, right? Who is your audience, right? Who are you speaking to most loudly, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's a, it's a trade book from, a, you know, from Simon & Schuster, so I'm, I'm hoping it has a broad audience. That, and certainly, I think anyone who's interested in how we got to where we are, um, you know, this is, I, I think it helps tell a part of the story that hasn't been told um, that well. Um, but I think it, maybe your, your language of who am I talking to the loudest, I think is probably a, an apt one. I, I think I'm talking to my fellow white Christians. Um, you know, again, I think beginning the book with a first person sentence and ending the book with a first person sentence. Um, I think, you know, we white Christians, I'll kind of, I talk that way in the book. I mean, we white Christians 
um, bear responsibility. We, we bear the central responsibility um, for legitimizing white supremacy in American history. Um, and so therefore we bear the principal responsibility for excising uh, this and deconstructing it um, in our current uh, context. And, and, and certainly in my lifetime, um, uh, I don't think I've seen another moment more ripe for doing that than the one we're living in right now. Um, so I think, I hope that many of those things you mentioned happen. I mean, I, I hope that it, it's, uh, you know, uh, again, Baldwin, um, James Baldwin, I think was very much at the center of my thinking writing the book. And, and in some ways, I even think of the book as kind of trying to be a white Christian response uh, you know, to his call for um, a witness. Um, he, taught, he thought of his own writing as bearing witness. And I, I think in some ways, um, that's it, 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 what I'm trying to do here is to kind of bear witness to the truth, um, to kind of cast some light um, where there, there's been some shadows um, and, and hopefully um, with a normative end, you know, that, that, that this is something that really has to be taken up. And I, uh, you know, again, quoting Baldwin here, um, you know, he, he really saw this, this telling the truth to be really key to getting us anywhere. Um, and so I think it's, it's true for me that I think if we can find the courage, and, and I think it is kind of the courage and love uh, to tell the truth um, here, and I'll quote him here, um, uh, these eloquent words he wrote, he's, he, he wrote this more than 50 years ago, um, we can, uh, if, if we can do this, we can end the racial nightmare we can achieve our country and we can change the history of the world. Like, I think that's still possible, um, but it, it is uh, gonna be a real slog and probably a multi-generational one. But the work is right there in front of us. But, I, but I, this, what he talks about is this racial nightmare. We are still living, right? We have had opportunities to address it. Uh, we've had opportunities to um, kind of finally, again, excise this, um, thing out of our DNA in, in white Christianity, and we just haven't done it. And so I, I think there is a kind of moment of reckoning uh, here for, for white Christians that I'm, I'm trying to kind of help call the question on. On that uh, hopeful note, um, let's uh, end today's uh, conversation. So again, let me uh, thank uh, Robert for this incredibly rich and, com and complex conversation. And and thanks uh, Halid and Dugan for su facilitating such a deep and nuanced engagement with, you know, with uh, Robert and the audience. And for Pete and Nancy for helping to co-host this event behind the scene. Uh, and above all, I would like to thank everybody for joining us for uh, your contribution for this important conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.